is our final video for Chem 122, Spring of 2020, the virtual edition. And in this video, we would like to discuss um, some theories that explain the Arrhenius behavior of rates of reaction on temperature. So continuing on from Monday's video, there are two theories we'd like to discuss here. One is collision theory, and that will give us some physical meaning behind our uh, frequency factor or pre-exponential factor A and our activation energy E sub A. And transition state theory, which is a little bit more involved than the collision theory and helps us think about the high energy intermediate that forms as reactants become products. So let's start with collision theory. So we could use some physics if we wanted to, to just think about molecules as being balls that bump into each other. So in this picture, we've got a red ball and a green ball, and they can bump into each other and bounce off if they don't have enough energy. If the energy is lower than the minimum energy, if the energy is greater than the minimum energy, right, we can get a reaction to happen. So clearly our minimum energy is our activation energy, right? It's connected to our activation energy for a reaction. And our frequency factor is, has to do with whether or not these balls bump into each other with the correct orientation, right? So they could bump into each other with enough energy, but not be oriented such that the molecule can react and then they just fall apart. So this idea of the effect of temperature mostly connects here with the activation energy, E sub A, that's our minimum energy. So we can look at this curve of the fraction of molecules as a function of kinetic energy. And at our lower temperature, T1, right, the kinetic energy in general is shifted to a smaller value than our higher energy, T2. And also the shape of the curve changes a little bit as we increase temperature. So all molecules are not moving at exactly the same kinetic energy. There's a distribution of kinetic energy for every set of molecules at a particular temperature. But as we increase temperature, those that are above the activation energy, the number of molecules or the fraction of molecules that have enough energy to react will increase at higher temperatures. There is a great animation in chapter 13 on this collision theory that kind of shows these interactions and allows you to shift around the temperature and play with these curves. So I highly recommend that you view that animation. If you click on the screen in the slides version of this video, then you can just click on that or you can just open up your Norton account with SmartWorks and click on animations and go to chapter 13. So now I'd like to move on and think about improving on that collision theory for solutions. So collision theory works really great for gas phase reactions where I can really think of my molecules as just being balls that bump into each other and they're not bumping into anything else because gases aren't very dense and they're not running into solvent molecules or anything. But for a lot of reactions that happen in solution, collision theory doesn't work so well. So here we have to think about the molecules meeting each other and still acquiring enough energy to react. But instead of that approach being two things coming together in a collision, we have to imagine the molecules bumping into each other, approaching each other through solvent, right? So in gas phase, that's just psh, the collision. In solution, the approach is more of a zigzag walk through the solvent molecules until they can find each other. So they may be interacting with the solvent, right? They may be attracted to the solvent. Those things will affect how this works. But eventually we can imagine the two molecules coming into contact. So here we still have our red and green balls coming into contact with sufficient energy. So they might get that energy with a little kick from a solvent molecule, right? They bump into a solvent molecule or the solvent molecule bumps into them and pushes them into the other reactant molecule so they can go on to make product. So one way to envision this and think about what's happening in terms of energy is to look at a reaction energy profile or reaction diagram, right? So we've got potential energy as a function of the progress of the reaction. 
So in this, we've got an exothermic reaction, right? Our reactants are at higher energy than our products. So we will go downhill in general from reactants to products. And we see that we have to climb this barrier to get from reactants to what's called the transition state or the activated complex. So we still have to get up this energy. So that's our kick in energy so that we are starting to make bonds and break bonds so that we can either fall down to products or fall back down to reactants. So only enough energies, only molecules with enough energy can overcome this activation of energy barrier or the activation energy. So this is our general way of depicting reactions with these energy diagrams or energy profiles where we have extensive reaction as a function of potential energy. So this is for a generic A plus B goes to C plus D exothermic reaction where we've got reactants, products, has to overcome this barrier or the activation energy. And what's at top of this hill is called the transition state or the activated complex. And we've actually already looked at the difference between the potential energy of or the energy of reactants and energy of products, and we call that the enthalpy change of the reaction. So note that if we're going in this direction, it's exothermic, right? And if we go in the other direction, the reverse direction would be the endothermic direction of that reaction. And the activation energy for the endothermic direction is larger and more sensitive to temperature than the exothermic direction of a reaction. Let's look at an actual reaction to kind of think about how this works. So here we've got nitrogen oxide and ozone becoming nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. So we can imagine that we have to bump into each other, right, with the right orientation so that the nitrogen is lining up with the oxygen so that bond can form and the oxygen-oxygen bond in ozone can break. Right? So this direction of the reaction, and then we have NO3 and oxygen gas as our products, there's a relatively small barrier, right? 10.5 kilojoules per mole for us to go in this direction. So if we think about the reverse direction of that reaction, right? Nitrogen dioxide and oxygen becoming NO and ozone, now we have a higher barrier, right? Now we have 210 kilojoules per mole to overcome for our now reactants to become products. So now we are breaking this bond and making this bond. So we can think of those reactions in the energy diagram together. So let me put them together for you, both pictures. So this is kind of our forward direction, 10.5 kilojoules per mole and or our exothermic direction and then our endothermic direction is 210 kilojoules per mole. So looking at these two together, what is the enthalpy change of the reaction? What is the delta H? Couldn't we just subtract the two activation energies? Because it's really that delta H is just this distance Right here between reactants and product. Right? That's our value of delta H. Does that look more like an H? So 210 subtract 10.5, we get 199.5 kilojoules per mole is the enthalpy change. So if we're going from reactants to products, that's gonna be a negative 199.5 kilojoules per mole, right, in that direction. If we're going from products up to reactants, the way, it's going to be an endothermic reaction or a positive 199.5 kilojoules per mole. So we can use these energy diagrams to help us think about enthalpy changes and activation energies and how all of these things are connected. We can also use activation energy diagrams or reaction profiles to help us think about the mechanism of a reaction. So in this reaction, we have NO2 and oxygen becoming 
Oops, yeah, NO2 becoming NO3 and NO, and then, then that falls apart into NO and oxygen. So what are the steps involved in the reaction if I want to go from 2NO2 to 2NO and oxygen? So it looks like there's two activation energies, so there must be two steps in our reaction. And so we can analyze an energy profile to help us think about which one is our slow step and which one is our fast step, right? So the higher the activation energy, the slower that step will be in our mechanism of reactions. So we talked about mechanisms quite a bit in Chem 120 in our kinetics, where we thought about, well, if there's a slow step and a fast step, we can analyze or at least justify a mechanism to fit with the data. So this is just another set of data to help us decide what that reaction mechanism is. Okay, so now let's look at how we can use these energy profiles to think about the effect of a catalyst on an actual real life reaction. So again, we're looking at energy as the reaction progresses and we can see that this is a two-step mechanism. So let's just focus on the blue line right now. So that blue line is the two-step mechanism of the depletion of ozone to oxygen. So the first step in this mechanism is an ozone molecule falling apart into an oxygen atom and an oxygen molecule. The second step is when that oxygen atom interacts with another ozone molecule to make two oxygen atoms. So we can see from our blue curve that the first step is a lower activation energy than the second step. And the second step is our uncatalyzed activation energy of 17.7 kilojoules per mole. So it takes quite a bit of energy for this oxygen and ozone to get together, make that bond and break an oxygen-oxygen bond in the ozone molecule. So that's kind of, if we add this up, oops, overall we get two oxygen, two ozone molecules goes to three oxygen molecules. So the red curve represents what happens if we have a catalyst. So we see that it really drastically changes the energy profile of what's going on. So let's take a look at our catalyst, a chlorine atom here. So a chlorine atom interacts with an ozone. It's still a two-step process, we see. So chlorine and an ozone become chlorine oxide and oxygen molecule. And then that chlorine oxide can interact with another ozone molecule to make chlorine and two oxygen molecules. Overall, again, the same result. Two ozones become three oxygens. So we see that we have drastically reduced the activation energy for this reaction. So instead of 17.7, the catalyzed version is only 2.2 kilojoules per mole. So it makes it a lot easier for ozone to become oxygen if it's catalyzed. The other thing that's going on, right? So chlorine is our catalyst, right? It's used in this first step and generated again in the second step. So that one single chlorine atom can catalyze many hundreds of thousands of ozones into oxygen, right? So we could think of this as a cycle. It just goes around and around and around and around. So having chlorine around is not so good for ozone. So we can look at some real live data here, um, thinking about over decades, what has happened to stratospheric ozone over Antarctica. So you can kind of see the shape of Antarctica here through this blue hole. So this blue region on this picture is the ozone hole over Antarctica. And so this is a plot of the area of the ozone hole as a function of time, what year it was measured. And generally these are measured in the springtime over Antarctica, which is usually in September on the Southern Hemisphere. And this particular picture is from this data point right here in the year 2000, which is the highest recorded hole. And this blue color represents an amount of ozone that's at least 50% lower than the normal amount of ozone that is typically present in the stratosphere. 
So that's why we get call it the whole, right? So we see that in the 80s and 90s, there was a rapid increase in this hole, causing much alarm. Actually, this doesn't show it, but this had been going on for several decades before this. But in 1987, so that was right around here, right? Um, the Montreal Protocol was passed that ended the production of chlorofluorocarbons, which contributed to this hole because they produced chlorines in the stratosphere, which then go through that cycle to help us get less and less ozone in the stratosphere. So now we can see that since that law was passed, we have a definite leveling off. This red curve almost makes it look like it's going down, but it's definitely not going up anymore, the area of the ozone hole, and does seem to be decreasing in the last five or so years now that we are not producing as much chlorine in the atmosphere and there is less ozone depletion. So just some real life um, analysis on the importance of catalysts and kinetics. So if you have questions about this, feel free to pop into a Google Meet Opportunities for Questions session. Or if you have questions about anything else, you can pop into those sessions. And if you want to talk more about stratospheric ozone depletion, I would be happy to talk more about that as well.